going to combine those two to make the true king of calamities. Ooh, that's really good if, Sil if Silverman draws either a Lost World or Dragonic Diagram. So, did you hear what he called it? I think yep. it was fire. It was fire. Yep. True king of all calamities is going to stop monsters with that attribute from activating their effects this turn. And then everything on the field is changed to fire. This is, personally, I think one of the most powerful Xyz monsters out there. It really is. This, uh, if you remember the World Championship, yeah. back where the True King Dinosaur deck was a thing. This yeah, was, I uh, played in that World Championship, yeah. yeah. I hope you remember. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's May 2017, the new year has just begun, and either you've seen your name like five times by now because it's your new favorite movie, or maybe you still play Overwatch nearly every single day, still trying to perfect your gameplay with Arisa and Sombra, the newest heroes at the time. Or maybe you're still hanging on to Pokemon Go, past its initial prime just the summer before. Despite all of the things that happened to leading into and during 2017, elsewhere in the world, several players of a particular card game would be summoning black-bordered cards and playing incredibly control-based and mid-range mirror matches. The most recent set, Raging Tempest, brought Yu-Gi-Oh! players one of the most splashable and powerfully consistent archetypes of all time, Zodiac. Leading into the next set though, what could possibly come next? Then arrives Maximum Crisis. Among cards like the True Dracos, the first Lairless support, Dragonic Diagram, and even Ash Blossom's first printing, we all thought that Diagram and Ash would be our largest worries. But it didn't take long to prove us wrong. To set the stage, the meta is absolutely flooded with Zodiac variants. However, against all odds, Joshua Schmidt has just won YCS Prague with 60 card Paleozoics. Metalfo Zodiac is the new most popular variant going around, taking the majority of top cut slots at YCS Denver by far. Little did we all know that one card in the new set would prove over time to be more powerful than every other card in the entire set. True King of All Calamities. Printed as a super rare, was considered well... Oh, there's a new uh, subterror. I also have a Raid Raptor Stranger Falcon and a True King of All Calamities. So yeah, super rare. That's pretty good. Pretty good is a bit of an understatement though. This rank 9 beast of a monster could turn your opponent's entire field into one attribute, then completely shut down any monster in your opponent's possession with that attribute, keeping them from attacking or activating any effects. And the best part, it only cost one Xyz material, so you can do it twice. But some of you might say, that's not Calamities, that's VFD. This back, and now like, that's a double VFD. And then the rest is pretty standard, you play two VFD. No VFD, I called this. I didn't think VFD was going to be on here. Ever wonder why most people call it VFD? Well, probably not. You likely know that VFD is the direct translation of the OCG card text. The True Dragon Emperor VFD, according to Google Translate, so take that with a grain of salt. The term VFD stands for the Catholic phrase Vicarius Fili Dei. It's no wonder why Konami would censor this name in North America, giving us the mouthful True King of All Calamities. But honestly, there's something about VFD and True King of All Calamities that is just outright badass. It sounds like something powerful, something godly. It only took a couple of months for a fraction of that godlike power to be realized at the Yu-Gi-Oh! World Championship 2017 in Tokyo, Japan. Eight of the 26 players at Worlds 2017 have been confirmed to have VFD somewhere in their deck. It shouldn't come to be a surprise that as the two-day event played out, when we finally arrived at the All Ages Finals, we would see two players, Ryosuke Tsujimura and Shenfei Milton Shua, both players sporting True King Dinosaur decks. This deck utilized the evasiveness and strength of the dinosaur engine, with playsets of Miscellaneousaurus and Soul Eating Overaptor, as well as the combo potential of the True Kings. Lithosagem and Agnimizid, in particular, both huge bodies with powerful effects, and both level 9s with the original intent being to synergize with VFD's last effect. Did you know VFD has the effect to synergize with the True Kings and True Draco cards? It's definitely an easy effect to miss. Both players had copies of VFD in their extra decks, so how bad could this go? As finals began, you might expect this to be a huge back and forth collection of trading card advantage and top level skilled decision making. It is the World Championships after all, right? Well, here's how it went. This is the last time this weekend they're going to be shuffling up. The tricky thing with this particular play is that anything could happen. And then he combines the two. Calamities could be super strong because uh, if his opponent does manage to get any monsters on the field, he's got a diagram to get himself another um, True King, right? And then he can use his opponent's monsters? Indeed he does. That was my question. Uh, yeah, it essentially just ensures his win. Mm. Because what he can do... Enough to be pushing us quite into game two quite early. Okay, he, he still has his hand, Max C, Ash yeah. Blossom. And he had nine pillars face down. There was absolutely nothing that Milton should do right there. 
Well, and he's going, he's going with a normal summon this turn. He starts with the over after. CG Moore just. And it's just a set card and go. So Denlon nine pillars. That's about the worst right. case because there are, yeah, that, that's basically it is to stop Tarano. The Denlong effect because it only activates if Denlong is face up when it leaves the field. Right, okay. Which is uh, why he uses Tarano to flip the face down. And he immediately activates it. Great effects. Gem tech or activate effects. So if he calls a Earth, goes for a thousand there, another Five thousand there. there. Uh, there's a handshake. And everything else attacks. And that's and it. And Milton is done for. Ryosuke Tsuchimura, the world champion 2017. The first new world champion in more than two years. I believe that footage speaks for itself. How could such a powerful card ever be printed? Milton got exactly one chance to play the entire match, only had one play, and through that single disruption, Tsuchimura hit him with the VFD on the next turn. Game one was literally just Trishula into VFD and you lose. So Tsuchimura hits him with VFD twice and takes the world championship trophy. Not only would this performance stream to thousands of players across the world lead to the inevitable limiting of Miscellaneousaurus and ban of True King Lithosagin, but somehow VFD would dodge this ban list entirely. At the time, many players likely felt that Konami would simply be more careful printing level 9 monsters to enable VFD. And that would prove true for quite a long time too. The player base was right, the following years would prove very difficult for VFD to perform. The decks most known for having access to VFD leading into 2020 were Invote, True King Dino, Gem Knight FTK, and eventually Fluffle. However, while True King Dino and Gem Knight FTK were somewhat viable at different points, it was still pretty difficult for them to be able to summon VFD consistently, especially when the Megatons rolled around and we were introduced to the bane of both decks, Nibiru the Primal Being. Nibiru being able to tribute off your entire field made it really hard to stick two level 9s to the board. And then once again, with the January 2020 ban list, Dragonic Diagram would be limited and Brilliant Fusion would be banned, both key cards in the primary strategies that could output VFD. And later that year, in August of 2020, the release of Rise of the Duelist would provide players with yet another potential answer to VFD, Forbidden Droplet. This card could be chained directly to VFD on your turn if they were to get it to the field, similar to a card like Forbidden Chalice, except the card types you send to the graveyard to activate Droplet cannot be used to directly respond to Droplet. This means that you would have to somehow get VFD to the field through Disruption and protect it to pull it off. Despite the card's sheer power, it would take a lot of effort to truly bring out its potential. Obviously, if the card resolved, you were very likely to win the game, but how long would we have to wait for new support to release that could enable this absurd card? Would it ever happen, or is Konami treading very carefully around the card? Well, turns out we wouldn't have to wait much longer. November 2020, Phantom Rage releases and brings us four new archetypes. Mutants, an archetype revolving around banishing and outputting fusion monsters. Dual Avatar, an archetype also revolving around fusion summoning. Does anyone know what these cards actually do? Tribrigade, a soon-to-be dominant archetype from the meta, as well as fan-favorite archetype revolving around Link summoning via banishing materials from the graveyard, and finally, Virtual World, an archetype focused on synchro and exceed summoning monsters of levels and ranks that are multiples of three. And yes, that includes level 9 synchros and inherently rank 9 exceeds monsters. Virtual World initially went a bit under the radar. Before the release of Virtual World, many players were creating boards using Crystal Wing, Shen Shen, Dragoon, and Chuche. However, upon it being released, it became more and more clear that Virtual World could not only play VFD, but release it to its full potential. Let's go down the list of weaknesses. First we'll start with Nibiru. Remember this card? How could you beat it if you're going to be making two level 9 synchros just to get to VFD? Well it turns out that the easiest way to out Nibiru and make room for VFD is to play VFD. What does that mean? It means when you make your first VFD, you can activate its effect on your turn and call light. This would force your opponent to Nibiru you, and after you've been nibiru you can extend with Lao Lao, summon a level 3 from your graveyard, and this will allow you to make Cloud Castle. On summon of Cloud Castle, it summons back a level 9 monster from your graveyard. So yeah, you could make a second VFD through Nibiru. That's how good this deck was at using VFD. Hence, the answer to Nibiru was simply VFD itself. Now what about Forbidden Droplet? This card had just come out, how could they possibly play around it? Well, your end board would be something along the lines of, say, VFD and Chuche, sometimes two VFDs and Chuche. Chuche is a trap card with the ability to destroy one card in the field anytime you want, as long as you have two banished virtual world cards to put back into your deck. So when your opponent would activate Droplet in response to your VFD on their turn, you could simply use Chuche to pop your VFD in response. Considering that it was very, very rare for your opponent to send a trap card along with their Droplet, destroying VFD in response to Droplet would mean that your opponent could not negate the VFD that was destroyed since it's no longer on the field. 
On release, it would already be fighting for a top spot in the meta. However, considering the meta was already full of fairly degenerate strategies, VFD was just another incredibly overpowered piece of the meta. However, at the first LCS featuring Virtual World, LCS 8, we would see it take the most top cut spots. Keeping in mind, this is still amongst the Buster Lock and Infernoble with Smoke Grenade. Despite such a good performance from Virtual World at its first major event, a dark time for the community quickly approached. With the quickly approaching Banlist update, no sooner than December 15th, 2020, many people wanted VFD banned. And one month after the release of Virtual World, on December 10th, 2020, the banlist would be released. With it, Dragon Buster Destruction Sword, Link Cross, and Smoke Grenade would be banned, and not really much else. Virtual World would continue to become the perceived best deck of the format, and with the next banlist potentially three or four months away, times were looking tough. At full power, this deck absolutely dominated the meta. Three LCSs in a row, and it would remain by far the most represented deck in top cut. No small part of the deck's success was attributed to VFD itself. The forceful restraint that VFD had on the format would lead to decks like Eldritch, Altergeist, and even Zodiac to see a significant boost in play, anything that can make an attempt to play through VFD's intense effect. This would be seen in full with LCS 9, where Virtual World would only barely beat out Eldritch variants by one top cut slot. One key thing to note here is that the player base quickly figured out another weakness of VFD by this point. Reading VFD carefully, we can see the exact way its effect is worded. All face-up monsters on the field become that attribute. Also, all monsters in your opponent's possession with that attribute cannot activate their effects or attack. The key thing that the top players noticed is that it only changes the attribute of monsters on your field. This means the card has one weakness that can be taken advantage of. You can activate monster effects in hand and graveyard that aren't the attribute called by VFD. Something that's been done before, but specific decks could use this to actually answer the field. Cards like Zeus, Golden Lord, and Entis, for example. Three of the Eldritch variants for LCS 9 played the Dogmatica package, giving them a lot of potential ways to answer the engine, through trap cards as well as through triggering monster effects that VFD did not cover. However, this simple issue would be very easy for Virtual World to cover. Simply calling Light in their standby phase would eliminate Golden Lord, Entis, and every Drytron name for that matter. Calling Light became the new norm, and at this point, it could feel like Virtual World was destined to win nearly every event. At this point, the true king of all calamities had plagued several formats, it had taken over three LCSs, and it had taken a win at the World Championships. It was far too powerful to remain in the game. It was seen as the villain of the game, and the player base wanted nothing more than for it to be banned. And finally, banless season. So starting off with the bands, I've got true king of all calamities going to zero. This is a bit of an odd one. Uh, I guess this is kind of a bandwagon hit, which is like VFD. At this point, it's like a petition. I hope Konami looks at like all these bandless prediction videos and kind of use it as field research. Virtual world dragon, very fun dragon, Vanisher, Fathomer, and the absolute disaster that is VFD still in the game. And Format's fine. And VFD, I guess. Leading into this banless season, players wanted to see Drytron and Eldlich be addressed. Some of the most common predictions were Cyber Angel Ben 10 to 1, as well as Cursed Eldland to 1. Many players also wanted to see the Dragoon engine hit, either via banning Red Eyes Fusion, Dragoon itself, or Verti Anaconda. Another problematic deck, Dinosaurs, had the community asking for Miscellaneous Source to be banned as well. This ban list was so anticipated that every passing day felt like another week waiting for the inevitable destruction of the format. And finally, only one more grueling week later, the community would finally get what they wanted. Okay, we're going into Xyz territory. Please, for the love of God, let there be a VFD. Uh, what else do we have here? Come on. Oh, Deng Long didn't come back. Really? Shockmaster still. VFD isn't here. VFD isn't here. I don't know my alphabet. Chicken yellow calamities. Let's go! And there it is, ladies and gentlemen. True king of all calamities is now banned. And there he is. True king of all calamities. Eat my ass, you son of a bitch. <laughs> yes! Oh my god, finally! VFD banned! Let's go! Nearly four years. Four years later, after the initial release of Maximum Crisis, the king had finally been slain. It only took a deck that could perfectly pivot around the card's weaknesses, summon multiple calamities, 
and have insane amounts of recursion for the card to finally be banned, but when it happened, it was an electrifying moment for the Yu-Gi-Oh! community, and really propelled many locals into huge numbers, as players wanted to jump back into the game seeing Konami actually address some of the most toxic cards of the format. Through everything VFT forced us to sit through, the king was slain. And that's all that mattered. Anyway, thank you so much for watching this video. This is a new kind of video I was experimenting with and seeing if I could pull off. I really hope you enjoyed. If you feel like I missed anything, let me know in the comments below. Or if you just had any thoughts about the video in general. Comments are the YouTube algorithm's favorite thing. And any comment about anything really helps. Thank you so much for watching and have a good one.